Please stand. Please kneel. Let us stand and pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in the ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the suffering he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet, he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him, lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking, taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty, for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner, while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me, Lord. Into your hands, O Lord. I commend my spirit in the face of all my foes. I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man, forgotten in men's hearts like a thing thrown away. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My life is in your hands, deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong, let your heart take courage. All who hope in the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. second reading is from a letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was a son, he learned to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the acclamation. acclamation. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. You are the word of God. Christ was humbler yet, even to accepting death death on a cross, but God raised him high 
and give him the name which is above all names. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. You are the Word of God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there. And he brought the cohort to this place together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus then came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you none of that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire, and they were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, what charges do you bring against this man? They replied. Pilate said. Take him yourself and try him by your own law. The Jews answered. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or of others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, 
Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. So you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth, what is that? And with that he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. And after this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted. Pilate said, Take him yourself and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jews shouted. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it was called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jewish chief priests said to Pilate, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, In this way, the words of scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala, Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. 
Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed. And to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It was preparation day. And to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then the other. When they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fulfill the words of scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in this garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. Please be seated. On this solemn Good Friday afternoon, we have listened once again to those painful events of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. But in his account of the Passion, St. John doesn't merely tell us what happened to Jesus on that awful day. He also wants to help us understand the meaning and the significance of it. You see, Jesus wasn't just in the wrong place at the wrong time a victim of injustice and senseless violence. No, he deliberately chose to take on the full weight of humanity's sins, all the cruelty, all the selfishness and wickedness that we are capable of. He stood up to it. In perfect love, he sacrificed himself for us while we were still sinners, praying to his Father that we would be forgiven. When he died on the cross, that Friday afternoon, it seemed like evil had triumphed. But John's gospel reveals the deeper truth, that the love of Jesus is stronger than anything the world can throw at him, stronger even than death itself. And so his sacrifice paid the price for our sins, redeeming and saving us. John also reminds us of someone else who was there that day. He writes, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. While many of the Lord's closest friends and followers deserted him through fear, his mother Mary stayed faithfully by his side. Throughout the Gospels, Our Lady shows us what it means to be a faithful disciple of her son. She teaches us how to say yes to God's call with courage and obedience, as she did at her Annunciation. She shows us how to keep Jesus present in our hearts and souls, just as she carried him in her womb and then held him 
in his arms. She guides us in sharing Christ with others, just as she introduced him to the wedding guests at Cana at his first miracle. And on Good Friday, Mary shows perfect fidelity, remaining with her son through the most devastating of all suffering. Perhaps only mothers can truly understand the grief and pain Mary, Mary felt as she witnessed the cruel torture and death of her beloved son. The prophecy made to her by Simeon 33 years earlier that her soul would be pierced had now come true. With every lash, every wound, every agonizing step towards Calvary, Mary's motherly heart must have been utterly broken. Yet, even in her anguish, she never turned away. Her faith and love for her son allowed her to endure the unspeakable. Indeed, she drew strength and courage from staying close to him. This is Mary's lasting example for us. When we are caught in difficult trials, sufferings, or sorrows of our own, we must hold on to Jesus rather than avoid him or push him away. Our faith may falter at times, but if we stay close to Christ, close to the cross, he will give us strength. On Good Friday, the Blessed Mother shows us that if we unite our sufferings with Jesus, he will support us and our faith will ultimately grow stronger. So on this holy afternoon, let us give sincere thanks to Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, for his redeeming sacrifice that has won for us forgiveness of our sins and life after death. And let us also honour our Blessed Mother, the first and most faithful disciple. May we follow in her footsteps, drawing closer to her son, especially when we're troubled. And from heaven, may she comfort us, guide us, and set us an example of true worship and devotion to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. We come now to the solemn prayers. You may wish to kneel or stand as you see fit. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ reveal your glory to all the nations, Watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Alan, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too 
may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestow your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in the hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We remain standing now as the cross is brought in for veneration.
Please be seated. We come now to the veneration of the cross. You're invited, if you wish, to come forward. You can genuflect or bow, touch the cross or kiss it. You might also prefer to wait till the end of uh, the ceremony uh, after everyone's finished to come up to the cross and you'll have the chance then as well. I invite you now then to those who are coming to come forward. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you out of Egypt from slavery to freedom, but you led your Savior to the cross. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. For forty years I led you safely through the desert. I fed you with manna from heaven and brought you to a land of plenty. But you led your Savior to the cross. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. What more could I have done for you? I planted you as my fairest vine, but you yielded only bitterness. When I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink, and you pierced your Savior's side with a lance. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us.
Please stand. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us stand and pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just at the end of the ceremony, just a reminder that we have the big plastic boxes at the, both the entrances. If anyone has any trocar boxes or uh, um, contributions for trocra uh, to bring with them today. There's also baskets out for the Good Friday Collection. The Good Friday Collection is always for Christians living in the Holy Land, and especially this year, most of the Christians live in the Palestinian areas and are obviously caught up in the crossfire of the war between Israel and Hamas, and they are very much in need of our help and support and our prayers, and any uh, support we can give them either financial or prayer, is very much needed this year. The church is open for private prayer if you'd like to stay behind for a while or come back later. From 6 o'clock, there'll be an hour of confessions, and then at 7 o'clock, there's Stations of the Cross tonight for those who wish to go to that. I'll warn you now, it's the same sermon, uh, so, uh, but we keep a quiet and respectful air in the church today, and especially once, we've leave, once we're leaving, you're asked to leave as quietly as you can. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen.